A few weeks ago, we learned that the church is called a body in the New Testament. And just like the human body, it's comprised of different parts. And you are a part of the body if you're a Christian, and you have a job to do, just like the parts of our human bodies have different functions in our bodies. We also learned that the church is a family. And even though we're imperfect, we still love and care for each other. Last week, we learned that we are a flock. And flocks are rescued by the chief shepherd and led by under-shepherds who he deputizes. If you missed one of those three sermons, I would sure encourage you to go online at howellchurch.org and find the message there and review these biblical portraits of the local church. It's a wonderful and a biblical thing to be a part of an imperfect yet biblical church. I also want to welcome the folks that have joined us online this morning, and uh, I hope uh, we are an encouragement to you. And uh, the handout that I mentioned earlier, as well as this handout that we're following along with on the Scriptures, I'll uh, make sure to put those on the church Facebook page at some point or the website so that you can receive them there as well. Today we focus on the reality that we are citizens in a kingdom. What does that mean? Well, the kingdom imagery is used from Matthew when Jesus is presented as the King of Kings, the King of the Jews, all the way through Revelation when He returns as King of Kings. And I want to begin by looking at Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet or qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated or transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Here, writing the Colossian believers, Paul says that for those who are in Christ, they have received a transfer from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus. As you continue through the New Testament, you discover that Paul used the expressions, the kingdom of God. In Acts 28, the Bible says when he was on house arrest in Rome, that he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. What is all this talk about the kingdom of God? What is this? Well, I've given you a a definition to the best of my ability to articulate what the spirit of this expression means as you find it in the New Testament. The kingdom of God encompasses all those who know God and refers to His spiritual work in and through their lives. His kingdom spans time and knows no geographical boundaries. It includes the Old Testament saints and New Testament believers, both alive and those already in heaven, and it extends to Jesus' eventual earthly reign and beyond in the new heaven and the new earth. My desire as we consider the fact that as a church and as believers in the New Testament 2020, we are citizens of a kingdom. My desire as we consider that is that we will sense that we are a part of something greater than ourselves. We are a part of something that can't be bound to planet earth. We are a part of something that is near to the heart of God, that is far-reaching, that is glorious and eternal, and that invites people from all nations and languages to come under the loving and generous rule of a good and faithful and strong and kind King, Jesus. And we are called as citizens to prepare for His ultimate coming. There are three ways in the New Testament, I believe, that we can understand God's kingdom and appreciate our role in it because we have a role. Our church is an embassy. Even though we're spread out in three different services this morning and some are even uh, homebound, we are, as a body of believers, an embassy of heaven's kingdom where His citizens living under His authority, gather to honor Him, to invite others to join them, and to prepare for His return. So three things to consider this morning. First of all, consider the nature of God's kingdom. What kind of a kingdom is this? 
Is it a monarchy? Is it a dictatorship? Is it a constitutional republic? What kind of kingdom is this? Well, three things I'd like to say. First of all, it's heavenly, not earthly. When Jesus was in Pilate's custody, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. You see, Pilate ruled a small portion of an earthly kingdom, but Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight, but my kingdom is not from here because his kingdom is heavenly, not earthly. It's not something we construct here. It's not something we bring down to earth, as some have said. No, we do work toward its ultimate end by inviting people here to join us in that kingdom there. So we do this kingdom's work, but it's not an earthly kingdom. It's a heavenly kingdom. Hebrews chapter 11 describes the people of faith as an inspiration and example to us, and it describes Abraham and Sarah and others like them who died in faith and saw themselves as strangers and pilgrims on the earth because they declared that they seek a country, a better country, a heavenly country. That's what Hebrews 11 says. And that's how we should feel. Verses like that inspired old songs like, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. And Christians need songs like that and verses like this and sermons like this because we are often tempted by our human nature and surroundings to focus mostly on the here and now, on the earthly pursuits of this world's kingdoms. Material possessions, fleeting pleasures, social power, these are things that mankind thirsts for and grasps for, but that's all earthly. And Colossians 3 tells us that if we are in Christ, We should seek those things which are above, where Christ sits. Think of this kingdom language. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. This is a heavenly kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. Secondly, this kingdom is spiritual, not physical. It's not made of flesh and blood or of brick and mortar or of weapons of warfare. This kingdom is experienced spiritually at the heart and soul level. Jeremy Treat says it's not the culmination of human potential and effort. It is the intervention of God's royal grace into a sinful and broken world. It's spiritual. Jesus told the woman at the well, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. This is a spiritual kingdom, which means the appeal to your life is at a heart and soul level. Not the Churches and the kingdom of Christ and the Word of God isn't designed to appeal only to your physical senses. It's designed to appeal to something on the inside, at the heart, which means it's not about man-made rituals or ceremonies. It's not about rule-keeping or even church going. It's so much more than that. It's about hearts that have been transformed by the grace of God who hunger and thirst for nothing less than a personal connection with their Creator. And because it's spiritual, not physical, it can't have boundaries. It doesn't. It can't be contained through geographical lines. Uh, The kingdom of God is operating today uh, behind iron curtains and in communist countries and in places like China or Afghanistan or Russia or Iraq, the kingdom of God is there because it knows no geographical, physical limitation. Revelation 5 says that the people in this kingdom are from every kindred and tongue and people and nation. It's spiritual. It's heavenly. And thirdly, it's eternal, not temporal. In this kingdom, there is no end. There are no term limits for our king, and he will never face re-election because it's eternal. Psalm 146.10, the Lord shall reign forever unto all generations. When Jesus was in the womb of Mary and the angel came to her and instructed her 
that she would be with child, the angel said to her about Jesus, He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. The most powerful and awe-inspiring kingdoms of earth are temporal. You may remember Bible stories about the threatenings of kings like Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon or Sennacherib from Assyria on the Jewish people, and they were foes to be sure. They were a force to be reckoned with, and ultimately Israel fell to Babylon and to Assyria. But those kingdoms ended long ago. Caesar Augustus' kingdom ended. Alexander the Great's kingdom ended. Adolf Hitler's kingdom ended. Saddam Hussein's kingdom ended. Kim Jong-un's kingdom will one day end. Vladimir Putin's kingdom will one day end. But not Jesus' kingdom. Because of his kingdom, there shall be no end. When Herod tried to kill all the babies to destroy the kingdom, the king, though an infant, was safe. The kingdom was safe. When Jesus hung on the cross and Satan thought he'd ended God's redemptive work, no, he rose from the grave and the kingdom continued. And one day, Revelation describes a scene when the armies of the earth will join the forces of hell in final battle against the king and once again all will know that God's kingdom always triumphs. That's the nature of this kingdom that you and I are a part of. And that brings us to the idea that there is a ruler of this kingdom. The nature of this kingdom is spiritual and heavenly and eternal. And then consider the ruler of this kingdom. It's, of course, Jesus Christ. He is the ruler of this kingdom. It's not some human leader or some political entity. Its ruler is Jesus Christ. First of all, it was inaugurated at His first coming. This kingdom really came to earth when Jesus came to earth. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the kingdom of God. And He said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So repent and believe the gospel. Jesus was saying, Hey, the kingdom has arrived. The kingdom has come. And so what Jewish people long had awaited and hoped for, Jesus said, is now here. In his words, Jesus spoke about the kingdom. He called his followers to live by a higher standard of values and laws, kingdom values. His parables illustrated how the kingdom operated and what the kingdom was like. And then as he began healing people and raising the dead and opening blind eyes and showing compassion on the hurting, his power demonstrated his royal power in the kingdom. Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty, 20, if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now these crowds listening to Jesus, they were hoping for a king, but he brought the kingdom, even though he fulfilled the kingly promises, he brought the kingdom in a different way and at a different time than they expected. See, they wanted an earthly, physical, temporal kingdom. But what Jesus came to do was much bigger and greater than they could have imagined, and so many of them missed it. And may we, in 2020, not miss the value and the glory and the beauty and the significance of Christ's kingdom. The Bible teaches that when He died on the cross and rose from the grave, He defeated in those moments the power of the kingdom of darkness, Colossians 2.15. And Hebrews 8.1 says, When he returned to heaven, he is set down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So we are living between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. His first coming inaugurated the kingdom, and now there is this waiting period until he finally lays claim to the victory he won on the cross of Calvary. And slowly but surely, the wheels of history are turning toward the one day when Christ's kingdom will be culminated. It doesn't happen instantly, and it won't happen peacefully. Evil, Matt Smether said, is in its tyranny real and destructive. But it's temporary. God's rule, though universal, 
is still in the process of bringing evil to an end. Jesus could have established His kingdom on day one upon His arrival, but who would be the subjects then? He has been calling citizens into His kingdom for 2,000 years, and that's what we're a part of. His kingdom was inaugurated at His first coming, and His kingdom will be culminated at His second coming. 1 Corinthians 15 describes a day when the end will come, and He will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father when He puts down all rule and authority and power. Why has He not done this? Because He is rich in mercy, and He is patient in waiting for people to turn to Him in repentance and faith. But the day will come when His kingdom is established. According to the United Nations, there are 193 countries on planet earth today. They are led by kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers, dictators. Some of those leaders are benevolent and good. Many of them, maybe most of them, are power-hungry tyrants who care very little about the people in their kingdom. But the day is coming when every one of those kingdoms will be turned over to the rightful king, the holy king, the just king, the loving king, the good and faithful and kind and strong king, Jesus Christ, the one who will reign in absolute justice, perfect holiness, and unbridled love, King Jesus. Revelation eleven fifteen 15 describes the day when a trumpet will be sounded and the voices in heaven will declare the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ and He shall reign forever. The Bible describes a moment in the future, when the armies of the earth will gather together with their scopes focused on God Himself. There will have been seven years of tribulation. Christians will have been raptured out and present in heaven with the Lord. And the wrath of God will slowly but surely over seven years unleash upon this earth and the hatred for God will intensify. Some will repent and turn to Him out of fear of God and awareness of His ability to rescue them and their hopelessness without Him, but many will rise in anger against Him and the nations will gather and the Antichrist will mobilize the armies of the earth with weaponry and technology like has never been amassed in the Valley of Megiddo, the Bible says, and then the battle of Armageddon will occur. What will the battle be like? Romans 19.11, I saw heaven opened. John was being given a glimpse of that day. It's going to happen in the future. By the way, just as sure as Jesus came in the manger, just as sure as He went to the cross, just as sure as those prophecies were fulfilled, this will happen. A white horse, Revelation 19, 11. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, maybe 193 crowns. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God, and on his vesture and on his thigh a name is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Spoiler alert, the battle is over before it begins. Because those armies that come with him on horses, you're envisioning being part of that, aren't you? I hope you are. Those armies on horses, you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to practice now for then. We're going to get those enemies of God. But guess what? You and I are mostly an audience. Because before it begins, it's over. Because that faithful and true one, with the word of his mouth, annihilates the armies of this world. We will stand in awe and his reign will begin. You say, that's, that's awful that God would do that. Sin will be punished, my friend. Sin must be dealt with. When you're sinned against, when people you love are abused or mistreated or sinned against, you want that sin to be punished. And imagine centuries upon centuries with millions upon millions of people sinning scoffing in the face of God, 
refusing his calls for repentance. The good news is anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith can be rescued from this awful day and can be on the right side. But those who reject him and those who resist him and those who will not have him to reign over them because they want their way and they want to worship who they want to worship and they want to do what they want to do and they want to write their own story will finally face as a result of sin the wrath of God. Because the ruler of this kingdom is not some slick and powerful politician. The ruler of this kingdom is Jesus Christ. The nature of God's kingdom is spiritual, eternal, and heavenly. The ruler of God's kingdom is Jesus, and the citizens of God's kingdom are the third thing we should consider. The citizens of God's kingdom. That's us if we're in Christ. <clears throat> the Bible says in Colossians 1.13 that Christians have been delivered from the power that is the, king, the kingdom of darkness and have been transferred to the kingdom of His dear Son. You probably have witnessed, like I have, either in person or on television, the swearing in of new citizens to the United States of America. It's called a naturalization process, where an oath is taken, and it's, it's a tear-jerking thing to observe. And, and uh, when people do that, they are naturalized. They are transferred from a different citizenship to a new citizenship. And the Bible says that for those who come to Christ, we are transferred from an earthly citizenship to a heavenly citizenship. We are transferred from the dark kingdom to a kingdom de design, de defined by light and led by Jesus Christ. So, I want to say two very important things about this kingdom, which is really the application of today's message. First of all, we are brought into this kingdom through the new birth. <clears throat> Nicodemus was a religious leader in the first century who was sure that if anybody qualified to be in the Messiah's kingdom, it was him. He understood the law. He memorized the prophecies. He was very proud of his rule-keeping as a Pharisee and as a member of the Sanhedrin. He was revered and looked up to, and surely if the Messiah were going to set up a kingdom, he would be one of the rulers in it. <clears throat> and so Nicodemus met Jesus. He was impressed by Jesus, but he was confused by Jesus because Jesus seemed to have all the marks of the prophesied Messiah, but he was different than what Nicodemus expected. So Nicodemus arranged a meeting by night in John chapter 3. And he said, we know you're a teacher because the things that you're doing, we know you're a teacher that's come from God because the things you're doing are so tremendous. Here's what Jesus said, verse 3 of John 3, verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What is this? Born again? What? Nicodemus says, can a man be born when he's old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Can, can that happen? And all the mothers said, no, by all means, no. <clears throat> Jesus said, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit. That is, except a man is born physically and then born again spiritually, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Verse 7. What does this mean? It means that there needs to be a moment in your life when, a, when like a baby is born from a mother's womb and a heart is beating and a lungs are breathing and a voice <clears throat> is screaming, that there is this moment when a person has, just like that moment, moves from the womb to the outside. A person walking on earth has this breakthrough, has this life-changing, heart-altering experience where their previous existence has changed and their new existence has begun. Jesus is describing a moment in time that needs to happen for every individual human in order for them to be ready for the kingdom of God. You don't get into the kingdom of God by giving money to church or charity. You don't get into the kingdom of God by joining a church or going through a religious ceremony. You don't get into the kingdom of God by first communion or infant baptism or adult baptism or anything else. You get into the kingdom of God through a spiritual birth. 
And I know many of the people in this room and have talked with them about their spiritual birth. And some people in this room, I've been privileged to be present when they were born again. When they realized the only hope for me to have a relationship with God and be in heaven in His kingdom forever is if He changes my heart. If He brings me to Himself, cleanses my sin, changes my life, and makes me His child. Or, to borrow today's terminology, puts me in His kingdom. It's a new birth. It's not a ceremony or a ritual. It's a moment of spiritual awakening when someone calls on the name of the Lord and is saved in response to the gospel. The Bible teaches that we become naturalized citizens at that moment of the kingdom of God. It's easy for us to forget that we're citizens of that kingdom, isn't it? It was just a couple weeks ago that the nomination was given for Judge Amy Coney Barrett to be considered for the United States Supreme Court. She was and is currently serving as the a judge on the Seventh Circuit. It didn't take long for the secular media to unearth a quote from 14 years ago when she spoke at the Notre Dame graduation for their law school. And she said, quote, Keep in mind, graduates, that your legal career is but a means to an end, and that end is building the kingdom of God. Oh, the secular media lost it. A judge that thinks she has some role in building the kingdom of God, shudder to think of it. To me, it qualifies her more, but let's not focus on that. Let's focus on the fact that all she was articulating was something that Christian people have believed for 2,000 years. This is not new. This is not fringe. This is what Christians believe. Christians believe that whatever they do in life, whether it's serving on a, in a courtroom, whether it's serving in a church like this one, whether it's serving in a factory or an assembly line or an engineering office, all of that is secondary to our primary citizenship, which is in the kingdom of God. And His purposes and His glory is really what gets us going in the morning. She said to those graduates later in the speech to continue to trigger the critics, I think you'll find when you enter the legal profession that most of your colleagues treat the legal profession as an end in and of itself, just like we are tempted to look at our pursuits in life relationships, careers, possessions, homes, goals as ends in and of themselves. But she said, don't let that happen to you. Set your sights higher than that. No matter how exciting any career is, what is it really worth if you don't make it part of a bigger life project to know, love, and serve the God who made you? I don't know a lot about her. I've read some articles but I know she understands something. And that is that those who are in Christ are not first and foremost part of earthly kingdoms. We are first and foremost part of a heavenly, spiritual, eternal kingdom. And we get into that kingdom by the new birth. The second thing I'd like to say today in application to the citizens is that we identify with his kingdom through the local church. The church is the visible presence of the kingdom of God, eternal and heavenly, here on earth. You know, Peter was a pastor, right? And Peter wrote two letters to Christians. And I want you to see what he said. Before you see what he said, I want you to understand who he was writing. He was writing to people who had been born again and had entered the kingdom. He was writing to people who had very little. They were suffering. He was writing to people who were of different nationalities, likely spoke different languages, and wielded zero political influence. And here's what he said to them as they lived scattered through the Roman Empire. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people 
that you should show forth the praises of Him who's called you out of His darkness into His marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now the people of God. He's using kingdom language here to say that these individuals to whom he's writing had very little in common nationally or politically before they came to Christ. But now that they have come to Christ, they are a nation within nations. They are a people among peoples. They are the people of God. And God has called for His people to show forth His praises, verse 9. To witness as His citizens, to live out His kingdom's values and to show our neighbors what citizens of His kingdom look like and how they operate, how they live and how they respond to difficulty and how they interact with others and how they live according to its values. So, I would think that wherever Christians are in this world, there's a little taste of heaven there culturally because of the integrity, the righteousness, the love, the grace that God's kingdom is marked by. The local church is not in and of itself the kingdom because the kingdom goes far outside these walls. The kingdom covers the globe and includes people in heaven. So we are not in totality of the kingdom, but we are an outpost of the kingdom. You could say that we are an embassy of the kingdom. What is an embassy? The United States of America has 307 embassies in this world or consulates. What is an embassy? It's a location in a nation that represents the interests of the home nation, right? It's a location in a nation that represents the people, the leaders, the values, the priorities of the home nation. It protects the citizens of that home nation if they're traveling in or living in that host nation where the embassy is. If you're a U.S. citizen and you're traveling abroad, you can know that if trouble comes, you can find the closest U.S. embassy and with passport in hand, you'll be welcomed into the gate of the embassy and you'll be safe there. In fact, you might be in Asia or Europe, but you're on U.S. soil when you're in that embassy. It's very important for people who travel the world, not just from the United States, from other nations as well, of course. So what is the church? The church is a place in a nation, on a planet, that represents the people, represents the values, represents the priorities, represents the leader of another kingdom. The church is an embassy where heaven's citizens can go and gather with their fellow expatriates who are residents here but are citizens there, who have something in common beyond language or skin color or nationality or affiliations. They have a king in common and they have a citizenship in common, which is why you can go anywhere in the world and when you find Christian people who know and love and follow Jesus and believe His Word and Gospel, you immediately have something in common that transcends every other kind of a difference between you. I would say this, the more hostile the territory you're living in, the more important it is to have a relationship with your embassy. Jonathan Lehman says the Bible establishes the local church as your highest authority on earth when it comes to your discipleship to Christ and your citizenship in Christ's present and promised kingdom. Michael Horton said the visible church is where you'll find Christ's kingdom on earth and to disregard the kingdom is to disregard its king. So we as citizens of His kingdom joined together to carry out his mission on earth. What did Jesus say to the disciples before he ascended back to heaven? Forty days he was with them between the time he rose from the grave and the time he ascended to heaven. What did he say to them? He said on one occasion, Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. That word power means authority. It means actually governing authority. Exousia is the Greek word. He says, all power is given unto me, go ye therefore. And Teach all nations the gospel. Hmm. So Jesus has deputized us 
with his authority. And so when we go, whether it's as a missionary to a foreign nation or whether it's in your subdivision just down the street from here or your place of employment tomorrow, you're going as God's agents, as God's citizens, and you carry his authority to speak the gospel of your king. We are likened as unto soldiers who are not fist fighting or fighting physically with people, but are engaging in a a goal to win people and rescue people and invite people who are currently captives to this world's kingdom into the wonderful, glorious, loving, gracious kingdom of Jesus. And this kingdom deserves our best energy. Matthew 6.33 Seek ye first the kingdom of God. No other earthly pursuit matches in significance to the kingdom of God. Could you picture the first century? Picture a globe with the lines of the nations drawn out on the globe. And picture Jesus has gone back to heaven. And it's a dark world. It's a world defined by sin and lostness. But in Jerusalem, there's a little light that flickers because there are some believers, 120 of them, gathering there. It's an embassy of the heavenly kingdom, Christ's kingdom, that's flickering on this dark planet. Picture all the boundaries and picture that light divides in two. And then those two divide to four and those four divide to eight. And one by one, little punctures of light emerge across that dark world. And they are not limited by the dividing lines between the nations on the map because no nation on earth has authority to stop them. So it goes everywhere, like yeast through dough or like stars lighting up the sky at night. These are the embassies of Christ, His churches with His people, shining His light and doing His work in the world. That is what God's doing in this world. And that's what you and I are get to be a part of as people of God. Why does a church like ours need a message like this? Because all week long, you are pummeled with information about the earthly kingdoms. Your employer calls you to focus on earthly kingdoms, the kingdom of whatever your industry is. Your Facebook feed calls you to pay attention to the earthly kingdoms. Your cable news channel calls you to be concerned about and advocate for your earthly kingdom interests, whether it's the stock market or the economic forecast, whether it's the pandemic or the weather forecast, whether it's the coming election or the latest political scandal, it all has to do with the earthly, the physical, and the temporal kingdoms of this world. And all week long, it's in your face and it's in your face and it's on the news and it's in your feed. And there's some relevance there. It has, it has relevance. We live in this kingdom of earth. We raise our children in this kingdom of earth, and we, we are uh, called to do gospel work in this kingdom on earth. And so there's a relevancy to spending some time and energy to be salt and light in this kingdom. That's why Christians should vote, and Christians should advocate for Christian causes, and Christians should be active in politics if God leads them to do that, because that's a way that they can love their neighbor and be salt and light in this world. Certainly that's appropriate. But I believe the work of the church is to call people together after 160-some hours of being focused on the kingdoms of this world and say, hey, everybody, look in the Bible. Good news. We're part of a greater kingdom, a bigger kingdom, a better kingdom, a greater king, an eternal kingdom, and one where Jesus reigns and where there's no threat to his authority, and you and I get to be citizens of that kingdom all week long this week. Let our affections be fanned for that kingdom. Let our attention be focused on that kingdom all week long. You have to deal with people saying, did you see what the governor did today? Did you see what Biden said today? Did you see what happened to Trump yesterday? Did you see what this person did or what that senator did or what this congressperson did? And I just believe that the work of the church is to say, hey, everybody, you've been looking at Governor Whitmer all week, you've been looking at Joe Biden all week, you've been looking at Donald Trump all week, you've been looking at the Congress all week. Look to Jesus because he is holy and he is good and he will reign forever and ever. I think that's the work of the church. 
and I hope you'll join me, to seek first the kingdom of God. Now, his reign one day will extend to all the earth. Until that day, though, his reign begins in your heart. And in your heart, Jesus must be on the throne. Have you been born again? Have you entered the kingdom? Have you began your relationship with the Lord? If you need to, all you need to know today is He loves you, He died for you, and you're hopelessly lost without Him in eternity. If you believe He can forgive your sin and be your Savior, we're going to pray in a moment. Ask Him to forgive your sin and be your Savior. If you are His citizen already, would you consider with me where our focus is, where our energies are, and would you help me declare to this community and even to other nations through our missions program, the coming kingdom, the heavenly, eternal, spiritual kingdom where Jesus Christ will reign forever. Can we pray together? Father, thank you for your grace and mercy and glory and majesty. We are grateful to be a part of your kingdom. I pray that you'd help us to lean in, and to serve you well as our King. I'd like to keep our heads bowed for a moment. I'd like to ask you to pray about this kingdom. Pray about your role in it. Ask the Lord to help you live this week as a kingdom citizen. Ask the Lord to help you this week to seek first His kingdom and focus your attention on what He values most.